So uh, usually um, Michael just invites me and says, you know, come and talk about something. But this time he gave me an assignment and uh, said, would you come and talk about, you know, why, why we haven't, are still failing so badly as an industry. So, okay, that's what I'll talk about here today. So uh, I actually found someone who had, had found something I had said many years ago and uh, translated it into Swedish with a slightly different twist. And it comes out like this. Um, so, so if you go from say, get in principle in a osikt. And that's the title of my talk. That the, the way that we're going to make progress as an industry is through insight, not opinion. And the main upshot of my talk is that the reason we're here, still after 50 years, is we're an opinion-driven <coughs> industry. Um, so I'll work up to that. I mean, at some level, the, the reason that we're, we're still here... Oh, by the way, there's an emergency. Um, at the end of this, you all need to change your passwords. So when I'm done, well, you'll all go in and change your passwords. So right now, I need you to think up a new password. If you have something to write it down with, write it down. No, not a real password. I'm not going to ask you to write down a real password. But think up, think up a password. Okay? Everyone got a password in mind? We'll come back to this. So, okay, Michael gave me this assignment. You know, why is the IT industry broken? The IT industry is more than 50 years old, and still, we're unable to deliver what the user needs at the right time. So that's what I was asked to come and uh, apologize for, and say is so, and explain why. And the answer is, because it's complex, and the complexity is essential complexity. It isn't just because of the method we use. It's not just because of we're using the wrong tools. It's essentially complex. Now, the methods and the tools add to this and make it even more complex. But even with the best tools, uh, if you look at the Knaven framework, Knaven framework says that in complex things, you cannot predict. And so we deliver late, we deliver the wrong thing. So thank you very much. That's the... Uh... <laughs> That's what you get when you ask give me an assignment, right? But let's explore this a bit. This is, I got to thinking about this, and it's kind of an interesting story here. Um, you know, we're not alone in software. So, I mean, we keep beating ourselves and say, I mean, look at Toyota. They're always building things on time. <laughs> look, at, look at manufacturing. Look at building. Well, construction, the construction industry, 60% of products are late. This is a survey I found done in the UK. Um, there's a lot of pressure from growth. If you're a weatherman, what are the chances you get the rain forecast right for more than nine days out? You're wrong 19% of the time. Airline departures, how many of you fly a lot? I mean, how hard can that be? <laughs> I know, I know, I know. You're just, you're just unlucky, right? Um, you know what? Some get it right. We'll come back to this. This is kind of interesting. Pregnancies. How many of you have been pregnant? 40% of predictions of when the mother will deliver are more than one week early or late. So doctors, which we hold to be at the apex of science and use of science, can't get this right. I mean, we're still back in the Middle Ages and looking at goat entrails and stars in the heavens to figure this stuff out. And by the way, adding workers doesn't help. Um, <laughs> software. We're about 33% of the products are late, so about half as much as in the construction industry. And the overrun is about 30% of the schedule. This is from uh, a survey that was done by version 1. By the way, you can find numbers that, that say anything you want them to if you look long enough on the web. Um, and version 1 is probably not the, the first place I would go looking. These are numbers from 2015, 2016. But I mean, they're in this 20, 30, 40% range. Um, by the way, paid political announcement. If you ever have any, if you ever hear anyone, quote statistics like this from the Standish report. 
it's all crap. And I mean, what it is is a bunch of self-identifying failure, uh, self-identifying companies who have signed up because their projects failed, and they've contributed their data, and the data that they're getting for these analyses are from failed projects. So it's not typical data. And there's a, a lot of critique of this has been published out of the Simulus Center by uh, I can't remember his name now, uh, of the Simulus Center in Oslo. So I'm not, there's nothing here, as far as I know, from the uh, the Standish report. Now we, you know, we have a lot of ceremonies, and you know, if I if I just do TDD, or if I have a code review, or if I use Scrum, and there's all these things we believe, and we have all of these rituals and things that we believe, that if I just do them right, and again, it's just voodoo. And I mean, we we don't know why we do this stuff, and that's my whole point. I mean, we shouldn't be surprised that it doesn't work because the things that we're doing have absolutely no rational basis. And I hope to show you this in the talk. And you know, we, we, how many of you call yourselves computer scientists? And it's more of a kind of an American thing. So you know, or you say you're. You, you, someone asks you, "What are you doing?" Oh, I'm an I'm an ET, right? Um, I mean, computer science is not a science. There is something called computer science, but when's the last time you had to solve the halting problem or the the girdle completeness theorem, you know, to, 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 to do a program? I mean, no one no one does science. It's voodoo, it's a black art, it's at least an art. So well, speaking of voodoo, don't got that password in mind? So how many of your passwords kind of look like this? I mean, you have an uppercase letter and a lowercase letter, and you have a bunch of digits and a special character. How many of you thought up a password that was like that? Why? <laughs> My mother made me do it. Who is the American comedian? The devil made me buy this dress. Yes, OK. Uh, Flip Wilson. But why else? I mean, even there's. This re a relative minority of sites that really enforce things at this level. Some of them are, are, are really getting draconian. But the rest of us kind of believe that it's, it's safe. If I do this, it's going to be hard to guess. Ha <laughs> you can't guess I have this special character here. How often do you change your password? Every, every, yeah, preferably never. So you change it, what? You're enforced, you're, let's say you're forced to change it every month. So why? So at the point you change it, does it happen to be at the day after someone starts cracking your password? It could be any time in the past 30 days. I mean, why once a month? I mean, by that philosophy, it should be you should change your password every day or every hour. I mean, this is total lunacy, if you think about it. So I just ran across a paper um, that's a, a new publication of the National Institute for uh, Standards and Technology in the United States, which were the ones who many years ago established those nasty standards that your, your vendors are requiring you to use and putting in all the special characters and numbers and so forth. And they were put together by a guy named Bill Burr, who was at, at NIST. And today he's saying, never mind, because he was asked to put together these password standards and he said, okay, great, I'll do it. Can you give me the password data and show me how many of these passwords that were out there were easily cracked? And they said, no, we're not going to give you our password data. You just have to work alone. So with nothing empirical, touching none of the data, none of the real stuff, he just sat in his office and made it up. And now he's saying, well, never mind. <laughs> So let's say, let's say you're a great cracker, and you have a, a high-end Unix machine, and you're a really good hacker. How long does it take you to crack this password? How long do you think? It's actually quite a bit longer. It's actually quite a bit longer than that. So it's about three days. That's a pretty good password. I mean, putting putting these numbers and the capital letter and the ampersand in it. 
And so, you know, there's some value in putting all these things in. Unlike the old days where we might have a password like this, correct horse battery staple. How long do you think it takes to crack this one? Now, this guy is thinking. This is, this is called a system two approach to problem solving. All the rest of you use system one. So system one is based on your intuition. I mean, it must be hard because it has all these funny characters in it. I can't understand it, and therefore a machine can't understand it. But if you look at this, these are just you know, configurations of 128 combinations, and each one you add makes it 128 times harder, more or less. You, you gain a little bit back from context. But why did you all say, no, this is, this is going to be easier? Well, there's a lot of these things. So by the way, if you, if you think that your password is super secure, go to this website and see if you've been pawned or owned. Um, chances are 9 out of 10 that you'll show up there, that there's someone else who knows your password and can very easily get into your account. Um, so just check this out. So why do we believe these things? We believe because, well, it kind of makes sense. You know, it's hard for a human to understand if I put in these special characters, and therefore it's hard for a machine and it's clever. Oh, wow, it's clever. It was done by a real guy at the National Institute of, of, of Standards and Technology. I mean, it, it must be true. And it's so clever to put in all these funny characters. And the standards tell me to, right? I changed my password on LinkedIn, or I got a particularly draconian site recently. I can't remember where it was. I think it was Google. Everyone else is doing it. Or my service provider requires it. My service provider requires it. Now we trust them, right? Because that, ooh, good man. Um, these things become part of very, very broad movements. And they become part of the social culture, they become part of the infrastructure. And we start getting a culture that believes things. Now, I, I used to do some anthropology work, and I was working with an, anthropology, an anthropologist from Australia. It actually was a student of Christopher Alexander's, but now he does anthropology work. And I wrote an anthropological paper, and I said that cultures will introduce practices into their culture because they solve some problem. And he said, that's total crap. He said these practices come up in culture just, just because they come up. So how many here from Denmark? So why do the Danes put little flags in dog shit? What pro you know this, right? You walk in Copenhagen, you walk down, you'll, you'll see uh, some dog shit, and there's a tiny Danish flag in it. <laughs> All over Copenhagen. Why do they do this? What cultural problem? It's just what it means to be from that part of Copenhagen in Denmark. And so maybe the problem it solves is establishing a, a cultural identity, but it doesn't really solve a problem. That's crap. So there's a lot of things we believe. And I mean, so there's some of my favorite whipping boys, like test-driven development. We believe test-driven development. It has been soundly and academically shown not to work. In papers by Cindy Alto and Abrahamson and a host of other papers, it destroys your architecture, and its whole goal was to create your architecture. So we have Dana, David Heinemeyer Hansen, who says, test first, fundamentalism is like abstinence-only sex education, an unrealistic, ineffective morality campaign for self-loathing and shaming. We're a really sick bunch. But we believe. And here's some good, you know, American Puritan belief and, you know, very... Uh, very self-deprecating. It must, if it if it hurts, it must be the it must be right. Because <laughs> we believe that there's pain and suffering and effort involved in success. And so if there's if I'm not 
you know, looking at the gold entrails right or doing the magic voodoo ceremony, I, sh I don't deserve to have good software. So I have to go through this little voodoo ceremony called TDD. It's total crap. There's no evidence that it works. I have yet to find any published evidence that it works and a lot of published evidence that it doesn't. Um, how about unit tests? How many of you believe the testing pyramid? And you know better than to raise your hand now, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this, I, I've published a couple of white papers. You can find them on the web. But I mean, even the software engineering research by, um, oh, who's this by? Uh, Capers Jones shows that, so here's this little itty bitty thing called system tests. And system tests has a much higher efficiency than unit tests. But yet, Mike puts it at the, you know, at the top of the pyramid is this little thing you do in the end. And there's nothing here about testing usability. And so now, you, if you look at the talks by, by Brown and myself and a lot of others, you, you see that what they do is they trim this. <laughs> so it's now a lot smaller than it was. So I mean, this is, this is but what we believe. Now here I think we believe because I mean, when I gave a talk on this at the uh, testing conference in Stockholm, why does a dog lick its genitals? Because it can. Why do you unit test? Because you can. Maybe you can't system test. Maybe you can't bring everything together and do the full integration. So it's people, people believe in what they can control, not in what works. And this has gotten us into a, a very, very sorry situation. Now, that's not to say we couldn't do it right. And that's important to remember. Because the setup that, that Michael gave me for the talk is that, I mean, there's something really fundamentally wrong. There's something fundamental about software development that's different. And it makes it impossible to get this quality. It's simply not true. There are some who get it right. And just the reason we're getting it wrong is we fall back on our instincts rather than using our heads. Now, where do you pick up with things like this? Where did you learn unit testing? Where did you learn TDD? Where did you learn the latest framework? How many of these things do you learn at Fuka Cafe? So I would challenge Fu Cafe to evolve into something where the speakers are giving more grounded talks instead of saying, my experience is, I was given a card, the speaker formula. <laughs> and rule number two is say, my experience is rather than this is the way it is. I am only allowed to give you osit, opinion. No, no facts. Now, fair enough. I understand the sentiment. Because, I mean, what Michael wants is dialogue. And I hope you come back at me and tell me I'm, I'm full of crap. That's fine. I love this kind of dialogue. But there's something about an industry where there's this political correctness that, you know, we're, <laughs> we're just going to do what's convenient or expedient rather than, you know, what has dutifully been proven to work. There's a lot more. How many of you believe in the Tuckman cycle? Forming, norming, storming, performing. Tuckman himself, in his first paper, said that there was no empirical validation of this. And in his second paper, he said these can happen in any order, and he pleaded people to do some research to validate how it works. How about the Maslow hierarchy of need? This pyramid that starts at basic needs and goes to self-actualization? That was made for recovering alcoholics. And Maslow protested for years and years and years, saying this is not a model of career development. This is for recovering alcoholics. And he finally just gave up. <laughs> Maybe there's no difference. Um, empowerment. Ooh, the Agile people are talking about empowered teams. Empowerment by management is abdication. And there's research out of Rutgers University for large companies like DuPont and AT&T that shows that empowerment programs cause teams to become decoupled from each other, to starve for information, and to not be able to get their job done. Empowerment is a way of cutting them loose in the ocean. Say, bye. It's your <laughs> not my problem. You're empowered. Um, 
Certification. I won't even go there. Um, <laughs> software requirements change. How many of you are agile people? So when's the last time you had a requirement change? Did the requirement change or did your understanding of it change? There's a big difference. So once in a while, requirements change. But the whole story here is that requirements are changing all the time. No, they're not. It's just a... Pardon? I don't really think so. I mean, it may be that the end user themselves don't understand what the requirement is and that they have to come to grips with this. Now, we have all kinds of tools for dealing with that. You know, prototypes, storyboards, um, use cases, all kinds of things to get the, the, the client in touch with their reality, to get the end user to think soberly about what it is I would really want before I actually build the real thing. Um, but it's not that the real requirement changes, it's just that their perception of the requirement changes. This is, this is, un, this is not substantiable. But it's a whole foundation that a lot of people put in front of the Agile decks about why we're doing Agile. Requirements change. No, they don't. They do once in a while. All of these things are examples of a, a psychological model called the Dunning-Kruger effect. And it's kind of, I mean, how many of you have seen the uh, Sorcerer's Apprentice, you know, the Disney film, you know, where he gets, his, um, he gets his hat and he gets a little bit of understanding, but it's not enough to really be a master. And so, I mean, how many of you understand how TDD works? Is TDD a testing technique? Okay, good, right answer. <laughs> Most people would say yes. <laughs> Um, a fact is it doesn't work, so that you understand it works is a little puzzling, but never mind, that's another thing for beers afterwards. But, you know, people know a little bit, and there's this cause and effect, a direct relationship. You know, bugs come from units. Bugs come from methods. And so if the method works, then the whole thing must work. And it just simply is not true. And so we have an understanding of the system that says the system is just the sum of its parts. And maybe we're about here, and maybe we're 75% confident that TDD works. But it's just because we're so ignorant. Once you get over this curve, the more you learn, the less you know. Until you start to get into this, and this area is called being a domain expert. Okay? Now, most people are domain expert in something. You really are. And, I mean, you have to dig inside yourself to find it, at what you are a domain expert. And I'd encourage you to do that and to leverage it. But most of you are not working in that area, or you're working in a lot of other areas and, and making pronouncements and decisions that don't rely on your expertise. I mean, you just did it for, for passwords, right? I mean, you all probably would have said, with 75% confidence, I believe this is a good password. And it's because you don't know enough. You have ignorance, and that leads to overconfidence. And it's impossible for you to recognize the skill that it takes to make a good password and even to assess how much you know, to assess how ignorant you are. By the way, who was I talking? This is different in Japan. This is a Western thing. So the anthropological literature shows this is different in Japan because the Japanese have Hansei and Kaizen mind, and they are always exploring and looking to be better. Whereas Americans, you give them a test, they get an A, it's good enough. A 90 is good enough. Why should I get a 94? It's still an A. A 98 is still an A. If a 90 is an A, I'm, I'm, I'm good. The Japanese want that 100. That's why I work in Japan. So individuals may recognize and acknowledge this if you have some training. But training with respect to real expertise, to systems thinking, to the real domain knowledge. So we assume more than we do. Uh, there's something else which is a, a cousin of this called um, the illusion of explanatory depth that comes from a psychologist named um, Adam Weitz. Um, and he's published quite a bit on this. Um, 
Uh, the classic that they, I was trying to think of a better example for this group, but you know, if I asked you, do you know how, your, how a refrigerator works? This is the example from their research. And most of you would kind of say yes. Now, if I went into depth about, okay, well, the compressor is going to compress the Freon. Where does the Freon decompress? And why isn't the whole thing at the same level of pressure? How can I have different tubes that have different levels of pressure in it, but yet it's a closed system that's just flowing? How, how does that work? So I really start pressing you on how a refrigerator works, and you, well, no, I really don't understand. Do you know what Agile is? How many of you are out here on Agile? How many of you are somewhere on this line? Now, you act on this line every day. Understanding what Agile is requires some unbelievable countercultural insight. And most people haven't gotten to it yet. They have this superficial, so called System 1 view of it. They haven't gotten into the really deep stuff. So when we teach Scrum, um, our two-day course is to take people viscerally through exercises, through hands-on, and to really come into grips with why we need self-organization, why we need the feedback. And it may not be for the reasons you're thinking of at the top of your head. So it, it comes down to the need for, for deep context. Now, <laughs> People have believed things for years, and these things have, have gone across entire societies. I mean, originally we believed the, uh, the Ptolemy, Ptolemy model of the universe with epicycles for the planets. We believed in witches and in witchcraft. There's the Flat Earth Society. And there's Agile Software Development. <laughs> oh, look at this. <laughs> it's, a, it's the same thing. <laughs> but um, you know, we just want to believe it's a religion. And it has its ceremonies and its rituals, its little things of voodoo. And this is going to solve the great problem of getting us out of complexity and putting us on a par with the sciences? Of course not. And this is, this is why software is in so much trouble, is that it has not yet come to grips with the sciences. Now, um, my wife's father was a, uh, was a poet. He was a great writer. How do you think he became a great writer? By, by great penmanship? By having the right pen? Oh, you have to have Jira. You have to have that tool, right? And we all think it's about the, the ceremonies, or the processes, or the frameworks, or the tools, or the programming language. It's not. It's about, I mean, if you're doing work in medical, so I think one, a lot of your big sponsors here are in the medical industry, right? No? No? But some of them are. I mean, it, it pays to know the medical business. I mean, one of my clients is making a system that will analyze a doctor's handwriting. You go into a doctor's office and the doctor will write something. It analyzes a doctor's high handwriting and makes a, a diagnosis for the patient which statistically is better than what the doctor can come up with. So they're going to make a lot of money in supporting medical institutions they're in Wales. So there are these things that we believe is an entire culture, and the entire software culture right now is caught onto this fad called Agile. And, um, you know, Scrum is kind of its handmaiden. And... Um, I was having, having a discussion with this guy from India right now who says, oh, 99% of the teams in India are doing Scrum. I said, yeah, I've been to India. I haven't seen a Scrum team yet. Abraham Lincoln said that calling a, a mule an ass doesn't make it one. Calling your team an agile team doesn't make it one. Now, like I said, some get it right. Some get it right. So let's come back to airline departures. Hawaiian Airlines has an 87.3 on time departure record. This goes all the way down to Frontier Airlines, which is 65.2. So I mean, there are some who know how to get it right. What do they know that the other ones don't know? Now, by the way, just this, and this is another talk. Where's the number one rated airline on here? 
top ACSI rated airline in 2015 is JetBlue. Well, hmm, that's interesting. Well, we'll come back to that. Um, here's a couple of projects in Finland. One is outside of Tampere. And the other one is on the west end of uh, Helsinki. And how come I can't turn off the sound? One of these titles means project manager, and the other means director. Now, one of these projects. Oh, why can't I get rid of the sound? Yeah, cut it at the source. There we go. One of these projects came in six months ahead of schedule. The project manager found an old bomb shelter where they could lower some mining equipment and come in from the other end. And the other one, which started at 600 million euro, is currently at 1.2 billion euro, more than a year over schedule, and there is no anticipated opening date for it. Just by looking at these videos, which one do you think is six months ahead of schedule? <laughs> Domain knowledge. In J Japanese, this is called going down to the gemba, being on the factory floor, being in the midst of the complexity, the transition from vision to realization. If you're out there with a shovel having opening ceremonies and the guy playing the trumpet and wearing the suit and tie in your office, uh, he was fired in November and replaced by another guy in a suit and tie. <laughs> and like I say, there's still, this thing has become a national parody. If you do searches on the web, you will find folk songs called the, uh, the Lancimetro, um, where they just make it, it's just a really bitter parody. Uh, people are so fed up with this. It has to do with being involved. Now, this is a project worth studying, if you want to understand Agile. These people are doing some, some really cool stuff. It takes deep context. Domain knowledge. Truly building on tacit knowledge and making tacit knowledge explicit. In your domain, not software development. Software development is like learning the pen. You don't become a great poet with great handwriting. You come by learning the language, the culture, history, mythology, human psychology. You learn, by, you learn about building tunnels. Not only by building tunnels, but by learning how people come into stations, how the rain comes into stations. This is the big problem with the stations in Helsinki right now. Tunnels are done. Civil engineering part? Yeah. No problem. Just <laughs> the stations don't work. The whole focus of Nonaka Sensei, who was the godfather of Scrum, is about knowledge management with the Seiki model. It starts with the knowledge. It's not the process and the backlogs and all of this. It's valuing knowledge and keeping a treasure of knowledge. And we, we tend to believe methodology and makes up for a lack of this, and it's just wrong. So this is a slide from Nanaka Sensei that he gave at the Scrum Gathering in Tokyo. It's been about three years ago now, where he traces the history of Scrum that started with his paper in Harvard Business Review called The New New Product Development Game. And then there was another one later. And both of these are about capturing knowledge. And then, look what's next, the organizational patterns, which were a way of capturing knowledge about how you build a product. And then there's some things here. We worked through the book, The Agile Manifesto, and now he and uh, another author have a, a book that kind of ties all of this together into the place of knowledge management in Scrum. It's about the knowledge, domain knowledge. And I mean, the XP people try to tell us, we don't need this. All you need to do is hire a great Agile consultant, and they'll bring in the right process, and the right process will make it work. No, it's a deep domain knowledge. So the last kind of part of this talk is, and this is, I'm just going to read directly, because Watson here has put these words so well. I can't have said it better. And he has just published an article. This just came out last, last month. He's from Amazon. And um, he just ended up at Amazon and was reflecting on why is he there, what's happening in their career, in the careers of consultants today. And he says, why do 40% of software projects fail, even after we've been doing, going at this for problem for 50 years? 
He says, the most valuable asset in the software industry is the synthesis of programming skill and deep context in the business problem domain in one skull. So this isn't about T-shaped individuals. This is about individuals who understand the business. Richard Gabriel, the founder of a company called Lucid, they made, they made Lisp tools. And so how many of you have used uh, Lucid Emacs, for example? That was a long ago leftover from that company. Um, Dick Gabriel was the creator, co-creator of CLOS and Scheme. Um, he said that his programmers could, could understand and work with a business spreadsheet much more adeptly than an auditor could because they were invested in the business and understood the business. This isn't about understanding coupling and cohesion or polymorphism or any of those. those that's how, learning how to write. You learn that in kindergarten. This is about understanding how do surgeons do work? What customer market segment I'm going to be able to reach with this kind of product? It's understanding the business domain, not the technical stuff. Programming skill, in the absence of business domain knowledge, is becoming increasingly worthless. So if you're a general purpose software engineer, whatever in the hell that means, what's a software engineer? I'm an electrical engineer. I know what an engineer is. I haven't seen any of it in software engineering. Software voodoo, yeah. Software art, maybe. Software engineering, no. Engineering is rooted in science. What is the science of your discipline? Of mining, of medicine, of finance. So Watson, who's at Amazon, is looking at the teams in, in Amazon and saying, this is what matters, is really knowing the market. Most of the time is spent thinking and communicating about a virtually endless number of micro-problems that seemingly emerge out of nowhere and constitute the real territory between the technology and the business problem. Part of traversing this landscape of micro-problems is inventing, communicating, and internalizing a plethora of named and unnamed abstractions it's the only way to break down the complexity so you can grapple with it. What are you taught as computer scientists? Reduce complexity. Get rid of coupling. If you, let's say you got rid of all the coupling. It wouldn't be a system anymore. It'd just be a bunch of disembodied objects. Coupling is what makes it a system. But you believe that coupling is evil. No, it's not. Accidental complexity, accidental coupling is a bad thing. And people fail to distinguish. You want to keep the, the essential coupling. That's part, how do you know what to keep and how to throw away deep domain knowledge? Why didn't you account for that in your estimate? You didn't account for it because the software development process is exploratory by nature. It's not a science. You can't go from first principles. It's like art. Most artists will you know, erase a painting and redo parts of it again and again and again. Software should be the same way. Fred Brooks said, build one to throw away. I have a friend named Dave Thomas. How many of you know Tate? Dave? Big Dave, small talk Dave. Um, so he is, he's, he's, he's filthy rich. And he started up a lot of companies as a venture capitalist. And one of his companies, they build a prototype and throw it away. They learn from the prototype. Then they build the product and throw it away. Then they build the deliverable and ship release one and ship release two and ship release three and throw it away. Every third release, they are throwing things away. Do you think they have any problems with technical debt? <laughs> I mean, the code is just typing, it's just writing. You're not paid to type. You're paid to think. Thinking is allowed. And you don't have to rethink these things. You carry over your knowledge and you just you redo the system in a matter of a few days or weeks. The nature of the beast 
is that software requirements rarely change. What changes is our awareness of them and our grasp of their implications. So all the Agile people are looking in the wrong place. They're putting the blame on changing requirements out there. No, it's your job to understand those requirements by working with the people in that domain and taking them by the hand and understanding how the domain works. You're not going to find this in your C++ book or your C-sharp book. It's just not going to be there. You're on a software development team. They send you to software development conferences and tutorials and so forth all the time. How many of you are in banking? When's the last time you've been to a banking conference? How many of you are in machine manufacturing? When's the last time you've been to a machine manufacturing conference? Oh no, you're a software specialist. Specialization is for insects. There's this book published called Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow. I've been referring to System 1 and System 2 thinking. System 1 is thinking in terms of stereotypes, simple, intuitive stuff. I want a messy password so it's hard to crack. System 2 is understanding the causes and the feedback loops and the dynamics. Systems thinking. So there's only two options here that I see for us to get us out of this, to lift those who have not yet attained this level of excellence. I think I missed a slide in here. Um, I did have a slide in for, um, where is it coming up? About SCAT in Denmark, the tax system uh, for gambling tax. They use Scrum and use cases. They came in 60% um, under budget and 40% under schedule. And they credited Scrum and use cases. Why use cases? It gets them into the domain knowledge. This was systematic in Aarhus. We know how to do this. It's a matter of letting go of the technology and working with the business. So we need to give up the things we believe, like coupling and cohesion and polymorphism and microservices. Oh my gosh, that's so stupid. Um, and ground ourselves in a system of profound knowledge, like Deming calls it, and use system two, or develop deep context. I see these are our two ways out. And the way, we, the way we advance in our careers and the way we train and the way we attend functions like this are, are usually antithetical to that. So some concrete things you can do. Last slide. What's a user story? Does a user story convey deep context? Do you deliver user stories? So how many of you are doing Scrum? So you notice it's called a product backlog. It's a list of product increments. It is not a list of requirements. It's a list of product increments that the product owner has put there to solve some end user need. It's not a requirements list. There's no user stories on a product backlog. They're definitions of product increments. Now you might go through user stories and understanding what the product increment should be. That's fine. You probably want to use use cases if you have a lot of them. No user stories on your product backlogs. Fight Yagni, think ahead and plan. Scrum is all about planning. How many of you believe, believe in deferring decisions to the last responsible moment? This is a total misinterpretation by the extreme programming people of a principle from Lean that comes from a paper by Ballard on what's called negative iteration. In Lean, you pull decisions forward. Yes, there is a, a last responsible moment, and you want to encounter it as early as possible. Deferring it is kiss of death. They got it exactly wrong. You never defer decisions. You pull decisions as far forward as possible so you can start working, and the system can give you feedback, and now you increase your domain knowledge. The system isn't going to come up and bite you in the bottom when you just want it decide you need the information. You have to work for it. Pull those decisions forward. Get rid of architects who don't code. I mean, either get them into coding so they're in there at that interface, that complex interface between the product and the code, or put them on an ivory tower somewhere where they're completely disconnected from the rest of the product and they can't do any damage, which is the real reason I think some companies title them as architects because they really can't do anything from there. 
the, the developers do what they're going to do anyhow, right? Get rid of coders without an HCI background. If you don't know GAM's law or FIT's law and don't know the basics of UX design, you have no right being an object-oriented coder. Object orientation, when invented by Alan Kay, was all about reflecting the end user's mental model in the machine. And the interface between that code and the user is the interface. So the coder and the HCI person should be the same person, or they had better be pair programming all the time. Otherwise, you don't understand object-oriented programming. Fire managers who manage production. So how many of you are scrum people again? And how many of you have a manager who's managing production? Who has some say in the feature ordering or the financial targets or any part of the business? You have managers who deal with something other than personnel. That's not scrum. Fire them. This is the product owner's business, not the manager's business. It's the product owner who has the domain knowledge, not the manager. And focus more on improving your business skills than software skills. Great penmanship doesn't make a great writer. So whatever your business that you're in, learn to love that business, to become a domain expert in that business. I mean, the software stuff, we, we can teach 14-year-olds. We are teaching this to 14-year-olds. You're teaching this to 14-year-olds. Huh? Seven. Okay, even better. Great. Seven-year-olds. I met this 14, wonderful 14-year-old kid last time I was here. I, haven't been, I want to get in touch with him again. That's the easy stuff. The hard stuff is the domain knowledge. Now, it's not that much harder. It's just that we ignore it. And I think it's out of a sense of insecurity that we feel our brains are only so big and we're proud of our CS backgrounds or accomplishments or mastery or our degrees. And uh, we tend to view the other stuff as, as secondary. And they're being shown the watch, so thank you very much. <laughs>